Everybody, it's Dr. Joe here on this Wednesday evening, chilly Wednesday here in the DC area. I hope you're doing well wherever you do tuning in from, and I hope you had a great week. I certainly had a good week, and uh, and getting ready for a, another good week. So, uh, well, it's a good week so far, anyway. And I uh, hope it, uh, you know, wherever you are, that uh, you know if you're making moves towards your uh, real estate goals. And uh, what we're in the tenth month now, or eleventh month, so uh, almost the year is over. So hopefully, uh, you, you know, if you haven't done so, check your goals that you set earlier in the year. And um, you know, it's not too late to get back on track if you're off track, and uh, and make some progress. So that way, 2023 uh, hopefully was a, a good year for you. Uh, it certainly turned out to be a good year for me. I've done a lot of travel this year, which is what I wanted to do. And uh, visited five countries, and hopefully I'll be able to go to at least another one more before the end of the year, and uh, and so on. Okay, so today we're going to focus on uh, seller financing. That's the topic of discussion today: seller financing, and uh, and why do we? Why am I choosing that subject for today? The reason being is that uh, as the, I mean, today the Fed uh, decides to keep the interest rates the same. But as we all know, compared to a year or two years ago, interest rates have risen quite, risen quite a bit. And uh, as a result of that, typically what happens is that uh, banks and lenders become a lot more tighter on their lending requirements. So it's uh, a little bit more tougher to get loans. Um, you know, they're a bit more conservative. And, uh, and as a, you know, compared to a year or two years ago, and as a result of that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people are getting denied loans. And so if you still want to build your portfolio, and uh, especially during the slow times and uh, you know you're going to need to look for other alternative ways of raising money and seller financing is one particular strategy that i've used um a few years back and uh, has some mixed results so uh in times whereby banks tend to you know pull back on their lending requirements there's usually an uh, an increase in interest in alternative or creative financing strategies of which seller financing uh, fits that mold. So we're going to talk about that today. And uh, specifically, we're going to talk about three strategies that you may want to consider. One is called subject to. Another one is called lease options or rent to own. And the third one is called seller carrybacks. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, it's going to be, it should be a good one. And as usual, if you have questions, uh, please tune in for, um, you know, put your questions to me so you can pick my brain. Uh, we'll be getting to Ask Dr. Joe Now uh, segment uh, a bit later on, about another 20, 25 minutes from now. So get your questions lined up. And I'm more than happy to try to answer them if I can do. Okay, so let's get going. Um, you know, the power of uh, seller financing, as I said before, in a market whereby when there's a shift in the market, uh, especially when banks uh, become a lot more tighter and stringent on their uh, qualification requirements, uh, if you're trying to build a portfolio, if you're trying to buy houses, then you got to figure out ways to do that without involving banks. And one of that way, one of those ways anyway, is to have the seller essentially be the bank. And so the, you know, you know, so the seller either borrows you money takes back a note or you take over uh, the seller's uh, financing and uh, and so on. So let's talk about why seller financing is why is seller financing your secret weapon during this time. So the question becomes this, how can seller financing uh, transform your investment gain? How can we use leverage the power of finance uh, seller financing to um, to transform your investment gain to uh, to allow you to build a portfolio during these times. How can we do that? Okay, so seller financing essentially it um, it allows flexibility. You know, um, it allows uh, you know be able to buy properties without the hassles of dealing with banks and taking loan applications, bank applications, and things like that. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a strategy called subject two, uh, which I'll be going a bit more detail later on. Uh, that allows you to take over 
uh, an existing mortgage. So if a seller has a mortgage in place and, uh, you know, and they want to sell their house, they may be open to what we call a subject to financing where you take over uh, the payments and uh, you can do that with minimal or little down and, uh, you know, and do on. I said, well, I've done that before and uh, I'll give you my experiences in doing that. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. And the other one is the power of lease options. Uh, as I said before, lease option, it does allow you, some people call it rent to own, uh, whereby it allows a, a buyer to essentially rent uh, the property with the option to, to, to buy it in the future uh, at a predetermined price. So the seller may, you know, for whatever reason, decide that they don't need all their money right now. And uh, they may be open to renting the property and, uh, and you buy it at a future date. Okay. I know it sounds weird, but there are sellers like that and, uh, and so on. So you agree on a pre price, at a predetermined price, uh, say a year or two or three years from now. And so the buyer has the option to exercise their rights to purchase the property in one, two, three, four years from now, whatever it is, uh, and so on. So it can be a low risk entry and, uh, you know, and uh, it's a strategy which, uh, you know, can do well. So if the price, if the market goes up, prices go up, then you may be able to buy the house. If you agreed on a, uh, at a, at a price a year or so, you may be able to buy the house at a discount, uh, you know, because you've agreed on the price when you, ex you know, when, at the beginning of this thing. So you can exercise your option whenever you do so. Okay, so next thing is, uh, you know, how do you actually, the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, actually executing seller financing. And it does require some negotiations. Most sellers, as we all know, all they want to do is just be rid of this property, get the money and move on with their life. They want to take the money and run. They don't want to get involved with uh, taking a second loan, they don't want to get involved with you taking over their mortgage, do a rent or rent in a house. They just want their money and run. OK, so not every seller is uh, open to, you know, seller financing, despite what the gurus tell you. And so the bottom line is, uh, you, you know, to broach the subject and to convince the seller that uh, this could be something that they may want to consider. There's some level of negotiations that will have to take place between you and the seller. So the question is, how can you secure favorable terms in seller financing deals? How can you secure these terms, which is a win for you and also a win for the seller? Okay, so crisp, uh, a, a critical aspect of any seller financing strategy is that you, as the investor, have to really do some thorough due diligence you know uh if you're going to and due diligence means essentially do your homework to make sure that you're going into this thing with your eyes open you know what you're getting into the seller knows what they're getting into you know you are familiar with the pros and cons the seller is also familiar with the pros and cons and everyone's going into this thing um you know with their eyes open so um you know if you're going to be doing subject two you better know, uh, obviously, the the rate of the uh, of the loan that you're taking over, any particular terms uh, that uh, the loan may have. Uh, you know, you need to all know all that stuff. And uh, another big thing is what we call the due on sale clause. Uh, you know, you better know if the uh, the loan that you're taking over has a due on clause. Uh, you know, part of that. And what that means is that uh, typically when you uh, when there's a transfer in title, which is what takes place with subject to the mortgage still stays in the owner's name, but the title transfers from them to you. So you are now the legal owner. You're buying the house subject to uh, the existing financing. So uh, so you are now the legal owner of this property during this transaction. But the mortgage is in the name of the seller, okay? So you're taking over 
uh, their mortgage. It says uh, a lot of lenders, uh, if there's a, a change in title, a transfer, like in this case, from the owner to you, then they want to uh, make sure the loan gets paid off and uh, and so on. So they have buried in their documents, usually what we call a, um, a do on sell clause, which essentially gives them the right to uh, to call them loan due, i.e. call that, uh, ask that you pay off the loan and uh, so on. So there are some legal implications. Uh, my experience, though, is that uh, most lenders don't really care, um, you know, as long as you make the payments. Uh, that's really more important to them is that the loan is paid off as agreed. And so technically, they do have the right to exercise the deal on sale. Uh, but, you know, in many cases, they don't. Again, I'm not an attorney. So please seek uh, counsel uh, if you're going to go this way. Uh, which means that also you better know, better have all the right documents in place. So legal documentation uh, is also very important whenever you do uh, creative financing, seller financing, and things like that. Uh, the documents that should clearly, all the contracts, I suppose, all the agreements between you and the seller uh, should clearly indicate things like the amount borrowed, uh, the terms, the conditions, and uh, the interest rates and things like that, because you want to protect all parties and uh, and so on. So this is uh, how you secure favorable terms. is through negotiations, uh, to do some due diligence, to make sure that, um, you know, uh, you don't lose the house because uh, the lender uh, is, um, you know, uh, is going to, uh, you know, implement or the due on sale clause and things like that. Okay, so there's some work, homework that you're going to need to do, and uh, to 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 sort of proceed with that. And then um, the th next one is what? Well, how do you mitigate risks? Okay, and um, as I said before, it's a lot of it is going to be your homework, your due diligence. Uh, to make sure that uh, you're able to do this and to make sure that all the documents are in place or the what's it, T's are crossed and I's, I's are dotted, T's are crossed and whatever that saying goes, uh, you know, in doing this. So the question then becomes, how can you protect yourself through the due diligence? And uh, and that's where the homework, that's what, you know, things that we do. Check out the, the, the you know, the documents that the seller has if you're going to take over. Uh, check out uh, the contracts uh, if you're going to, uh, you know, if you're going to borrow money from them and uh, make sure you agree on the terms, the conditions and all that kind of different things. OK, so next thing is going to be, well, let's have a look. So we're going to be going to uh, the uh, what they call it Q&A shortly. So if you've got some questions that you want to pose to me, if you want to pick my brain, please do so. It could be on anything to do with seller financing. It could be anything to do with real estate investing. I'm all ears. And if I can help you, I certainly will do that. So the question becomes, uh, the next one is mastering, uh, you know, sort of some of the common seller financing strategies. Uh, and this is where I'm going to go to a bit more detail uh, on the three uh, common uh seller financing strategies that a lot of people do use and uh and that's going to be what we call the subject to uh rent to own or lease option and also we sell a carry back so i'm going to go into a bit more detail um and, and maybe cite some uh some uh, examples and also we'll give you some action items if you decide you want to pursue that in more detail so if you want to pursue any of these things i'm going to give you some action items that you can start working on today and uh, and hopefully you'll be able to implement uh, some of these seller financing strategies, which I'm going to talk about uh, right now. So the first one I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, uh, the, the common strategy as I said before uh, is subject to lease options and and, and seller uh, carry back. So let's talk about uh, subject two, and uh, you know, it's, in my opinion, it, it can be a gateway. To property ownership, I've got. I think I've done about three subject twos uh, over the years, and um, so okay. So the question becomes: first of all, what is subject two? What am I talking about when I say subject two? 
uh what that means is that you are acquiring you're buying uh a house from a seller subject to their existing financing i.e you're buying the house with the financing in place you're taking over uh the seller's uh financing okay then the loan the mortgage and uh and you're buying the house okay so the title transfers from the seller to you but the mortgage remains in the seller's name okay and uh as you can see not all sellers are okay with that because it, especially this is the part which uh i find very troubling with some of these gurus and uh, when they sort of uh, profess this strategy is that uh you know if the loan is in the seller's name and if you don't have integrity then you may say well it's not in my name so you know so what if i don't pay and uh so if you don't pay yeah technically it's not going to come back to haunt you no it's going to haunt the uh the seller who allowed you to take over their mortgage so their credit is going to get dinged and uh you know the seller is going to you know the mortgage company is going to go after them and uh and so on so you know i always suggest doing subject to if you as the investor um you know are have integrity and you, the investor, are going to do the right thing. And you, the investor, are going to do whatever it takes to keep the loan current. Okay. Um, that's one of the things which I, I, I realize is that uh, there's a, a lot of trust that the seller is, uh, you know, placing on you. And it's really important that you, you know, you do the right thing and you keep that loan current. Sometimes the loan is behind uh, in terms of arrears. So your job as taking over the loan is to bring that loan current and then make sure it's kept current uh, as you move forward. So again, uh, in subject to the existing loan stays in place, you keep the loan uh, in the seller's name and, uh, and therefore you don't have to apply for a new loan, a new mortgage uh, and so on. That's the a, that's a beauty of it. Uh, and then you just work uh, you just negotiate with the seller in terms of uh, the equity. If there is any equity, how are you going to split that? Does the seller want it? The seller doesn't want it. Uh, there's maybe 50-50. Whatever it is, that's the terms that you agree to and uh, and so on. So, again, if you're going to exercise um, uh, or at least explore using subject to financing strategy, then you may you better do some due diligence to make sure that uh, you know the loan is in fact uh, a good one, and there are no quirky uh, fine print that could come back to haunt you. So um, you know again the disadvantage is that in theory the seller sorry not seller the, the seller's mortgage company could uh, exercise the due on sale clause and, and call the loan due. And what that means is that now you have to pay that loan off. Um, again, you know, based on experience, at least with me, I've never had that happen. As long as I pay, make the payments, most of the times the lenders are, are, are okay with that. So let's just give an example. Uh, let's say we're going to buy a house for what $250,000 and it has an existing mortgage of uh, 180. Okay. So, so it's uh, the property is valued at 250. And there's an existing loan for 180000 And so you're going to negotiate a subject to, um, you know, transaction with the seller, uh, whereby you assume that $180,000 loan, you're taking it over, okay? And uh, let's just say the seller wants 10000 And uh, just to wish them a merry, you know, go on their way. And, uh, and so on. So you now are going to raise that 10,000. You've got to come up with 10K to pay the seller. And then you're going to take over the $180,000 existing mortgage. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense on how we could use uh, subject to strategy uh, to buy a house. Obviously, it takes a certain type of seller. Normally, a seller that you know, are open to this either in a state of distress or they don't need their money up front, or they just want to be washed their hands off this house for whatever reason. It's an albatross around their necks, and they just want to be done with it. 
Or another common way is that the seller is having a hard time selling the house. And therefore, the only way they can sell it is to come up with some kind of uh, creative financing where they can help the buyer acquire the property and uh, and so on. So what are some of the action items that uh, if you want to uh, implement sub subject to strategy? Uh, first one is you want to do some research on due on sale clauses in mortgages and you better understand the potential risk. And the other thing is to uh, consult legal advice. Sorry, uh, get some legal advice in terms of the contracts. Make sure it's airtight and make sure that uh, the seller understands that the loan will stay in their name and the seller understands the risks associated with this transaction. So they are the action items that you may want to consider if you are doing subject two. And I have gotten a call, so I will turn my phone off. As they say, do as I say, not as I do. So let me turn my phone off so that way I won't get interrupted. Um, there's have a look. Let's turn my phone off. There it is. Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about is uh, lease options. That's another strategy. And uh, that's a good strategy in uncertain markets as well. Uh, I've I've been on the other side on lease options, which is where I'm the seller, I'm the owner of the property, and uh, I'm in the process of trying to sell the property. Okay, and I found, and I've tried this strategy several times where I've given tenants, renters, the opportunity to rent the house and uh, with the goal that one day they will own the house. Okay, so that's a a good way if I'm looking for market renters, obviously section eight, you, you're not going to be able to do that. But with market renters, uh, a lot of market renters will, I think they, they perceive themselves, at least they see themselves one day owning something. And, uh, and so you're giving them an opportunity, which otherwise they'll never have. Uh, they'll be an eternal renter. So this is a strategy of whereby you can give people, uh, you know, an incentive to rent from you. Because one day, if they like the house, they can purchase the house. They can exercise their options. That's the theory behind it. I've just never had anybody actually exercise that option, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, they can't come up with a down payment money. They can't qualify for the loan. Uh, they change their mind. They want to move on to their life somewhere else. And uh, I've just never had, never had a success with a renter actually buying a home from me, which is okay with me because I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not really looking to sell the house anyway. Uh, but I'm just giving people an opportunity to hopefully one day be a owner as opposed to an eternal renter. So, uh, so let's talk about that in a bit more detail. So again, it gives the, what it does, it gives, it gives you, if you're the buyer or the renter, the right to lease or rent the property with an option which means that uh, you have the right as part of the agreement to buy that house in the future on the, you know, in, the, uh, in, a, in a predetermined window. And usually you set a price uh, for which the buyer, um, you know, is able to purchase the property for. Okay. So, uh, so I want to make sure I understand, uh, you understand this one. It allows somebody who's a renter an opportunity to, to get in and buy a house uh, you know, um, at a future date for a agreed upon price. Okay. That's the gist behind the lease option or the rent to own strategy. And, uh, you know, again, the good thing about it is that, uh, you know, you don't need a lot of money to get in if you're on the buy side. Uh, if, since you're buying the house, uh, in, you know, at a predetermined price in the future, uh, you may be able to be a beneficiary of appreciation. Okay. You may be able to buy a house at today's prices a year or two years from now. Okay. And it does give you time to secure financing. Um, you know, so you can start building your credit. You can start building your down payment uh, during that option period, such that when you uh, exercise the option, 
you have the down payment, you have the credit, you have the ability to qualify for a loan, and therefore you're able to purchase the home. Okay, so uh, that's on the plus side. Obviously, in my cases, I just didn't find people to buy it. So they never did exercise their options. So let's just give you an example. It's 728 now. Okay, so I've got a few more minutes. Uh, let's just give you an example. Uh, just say, for instance, you are going to rent a property for $2,500 a month, $2,500 a month, and you agree with the seller that you have two years in, uh, in order to exercise that option at a, a predetermined price, let's say 300000 Okay, so let's just say that you know in two years' time, uh, the price of a house has gone up from 300 to let's say 325, and now you're able to buy this property with that's now worth 325 at a 300 thousand dollar price. Okay, you've been a beneficiary of appreciation. Uh, there's usually a down payment, uh, uh, an option money that you have to put up front, and uh, and so on. So, there's a lot more detail with uh, lease options or rent to own, which uh. Uh, uh, I don't think I'm going to have time. Maybe I'll do a session on that just by itself because you can have it whereby a portion of the rent goes towards the down payment and therefore they can start building down payment money. And also you can get them to start working with a mortgage company and therefore the mortgage company will be working with them such that they can qualify for a mortgage uh, You know, at the time whereby you're going to exercise your option. So these are some of the things that uh, uh, are possible uh, with the rent to own lease option strategy. Uh, let's talk about some action items if you want to pursue this strategy. Uh, there's negotiations. And uh, so obviously you're going to need to develop your negotiation skills uh, in order to get the best terms for you from the seller. And also you want to research market trends. Um, you know, you don't want to buy a house or put it under option and a year or two years from now, the price has gone down. And uh, because you may be stuck at being able to buy that house at you know a year or two's price, which may have gone down as opposed to gone up. So there are flip sides, obviously, uh, you know, with the option. And uh, but it does require a bit more, um, you know, due diligence on you, and it's going to require you to get some legal advice to make sure that the agreement that you have with the seller is airtight. Okay, so let's next one we're going to talk about is uh, seller. Carry back, seller financing, bridging the gap, um, you know, between what you have and what you need. So let's have a look. Um, so in uh, seller carry back, uh, you know, the seller acts as the banker. The seller acts, acts as the lender. Okay. So they're going to be the lender. They're going to facilitate your ability to buy the house through their financing. OK, so they're going to give you a loan uh, either by you can use the su subject to whereby you uh, they allow you to take over the loan. OK, uh, or if you still need money rather than, uh, you know, you going out and get money, they will borrow you the money. So you pay them back. So they're the, they're the bank. So you're going to pay them uh, the monies every month, every quarter, whatever you agree on at a predetermined price in terms of interest rates, the terms, and those kind of different things, okay? So uh, it does require some negotiation between you and the seller. And obviously, it's a contract. It's an agreement. So there are some contractual legal documentation that you need to have in place. And, uh, and you need to make sure that all parties uh, are on the same page and there's no misunderstanding. So let's give an example then. Uh, let's say you got a property of 300k as like, like last time, and the seller agrees to sell with a fifty thousand dollar fifty thousand dollar down payment. So the seller agrees uh, will carry a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar balance, but they're expecting you to come up with fifty k. Okay, so you got that one. So instead of you getting a new loan for two hundred and fifty thousand, they'll they will be the bank and borrow you. They don't need the money. Uh, I know it's sometimes difficult for you to understand, but sometimes, uh, you know, some sellers just don't need the money. Uh, in fact, they would rather not have the money because if they had the money, they'll be subject to some form of, uh, you know, taxes, uh, you know, some form of sort of capital gains taxes. So uh, so sometimes they would rather have the money over a period of time. 
as opposed to a lump sum, just for tax purposes and so on. So, uh, so they will take back uh, a second and you agree with them, uh, let's say 5% interest rate on 15 year term. So every month you'll be paying your $250,000 uh, $250, loan. And on top of that, you're also going to be paying the loan to the seller if they borrowed you some of that money. Okay. So uh, what are some of the action items in seller carryback that you may want to consider doing? Uh, again, it's negotiations. You have to convince the seller this is what they want to do. So you're going to have to build rapport. You're going to have to develop some communication skills, customer service skills, interpersonal skills. And uh, also, it's a, it's a contract. So you're going to need to make sure that you have some uh, counsel from legal professionals to make sure that your documents, your agreements are airtight and it protects you and also protects the seller. Okay. So, uh, so I just gave you three examples uh, subject to lease options, rent to own, and also seller carryback. Uh, there are so many other types of uh, seller financing strategies. We just don't have enough time to go into much detail about all those. But I wanted to share with you the top three. And I've done all three. So I have some experience uh, about them. And I wanted to share that with you today. So, um, you know, as I said before, not everybody wants to, uh, you know, get cash, take cash. Uh, they want to stagger it over a, a few months or a year and things like that. So there are a lot of sellers out there that would be open to seller financing. They just don't know. And so they're going to default to the most common thing, which is I want all my money now, uh, when in fact that may not be what really, really what they want. Uh, so there is some, uh, you know, creativity that's, uh, that, that, that you can exercise and uh, some negotiations that you can sort of, uh, you know, get into. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, if it works for you and it works for the seller, this could be a strategy that you may want to implement. So in conclusion... It wrap it up now at 7.34. Um, you know, in mastering seller financing, uh, you know, it's a great strategy for adapting to market shifts as the banks, um, you know, uh, tighten their uh, lending requirements. Uh, it sometimes gives you the opportunity to go to a seller and see if the seller will finance the deal. And uh, so as you, you know, investigate seller financing in more detail, remember that uh, it's not just a tool but it really could be a pathway to financial independence if you do it right. Uh, and, uh, you know, so really by understanding the nuances of uh, subject to lease options and seller carryback, you know, it does, it, it could give you a, a, an advantage over your competition because now you can offer the seller uh, some alternatives, which other people may not be able to. And uh, it's not going to work for all sellers, but some sellers may be open to it. And therefore, it allows you to differentiate yourself from uh, maybe another person that also wants to buy from the seller. So with creativity, knowledge and determination, you're not just really an investor. You're, a, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to be a master of your real estate game and uh, which ultimately will help you on your journey to financial independence. And, um, you know, so embark on, if you're going to embark on this journey, though, make sure that you can negotiate with confidence. You're good at negotiation. Make sure that you uh, conduct thorough due diligence, make sure you do your homework there, and also make sure you consult with legal uh, counsel uh, to make sure that uh, you're staying on the right side of the law and uh, it doesn't come back to bite you uh, in the future. So in the dynamic environment of real estate, you know, your expertise is really your ticket to financial independence. And if you are able to consider seller financing, that could be another I don't know, uh, strategy in your toolbox that uh, may come in handy whenever the circumstances make the most sense. So with that said and done, my friends, I am going to wrap it up for today. We're going to now go to the Ask Dr. Joe Now segment. So if you've got some questions that you want to post to me, please put them in the chat, uh, whether it's in the YouTube chat or whether it's in the Facebook chat. Uh, pose me the question and I'll do my best to try to get to them. And uh, I know it's a little dry, This the topic today, seller finance. It's not really sexy. It's not really, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. But it's a great uh, strategy. And hopefully I was able to, um, you know, provide you with the foundations uh, to consider, to explore, if that makes sense for you. Okay, let's go to the comments. Uh, who do we have here? Karim. 
big fan excited about today same here thanks a lot Karen. i appreciate it uh you're from new york city i'm looking forward i'm looking into your big city births can i do it remotely yes you can uh karim um if you want to do a big city borough, which is what I do, I buy houses, renovate houses. I keep my houses. I don't sell them uh, generally. I'm a long-term player. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, yeah, no, I'll wait till next week. We'll see. Uh, I, in fact, I, we are saying now. I mean, one of my tenants just left today, in fact. Uh, that's one of the things I did today. Uh, she, uh, she's been with me for nine years at one of my properties here in Washington and uh it's a four bedroom house and she was upgraded to a five bedroom house so now she's le she left today i did a walk through today and during that nine years and this is really where you know uh, i hope you listen to this for those people who you know where you buy is very important and so during that nine year period that she's in there the house has gone up from i don't know I think I bought it for 100 and something or two, let's say 200K. I bought it. It's now 800 and something in nine years. Okay. So there's quite a bit of equity that's, uh, you know, uh, developed because of just her being there. And she's a voucher holder. Uh, she kept the place in immaculate condition. And, uh, but, you know, in the space of nine years, there's, there's a lot of equity that's just, uh, you know, developed or uh, created during that time so what does that mean it means that it allows us you i if we pursue this strategy to build wealth uh you can now take that equity you know six seven hundred thousand dollars and do something with it uh either buy more properties you could sell the house i mean there's just so many different things you can do uh with that and that's what the big city borough strategy is all about uh yeah the time when i bought it i wasn't making a whole lot of cash flow yeah, you know, I had some ups and downs, but the bottom line is that in the space of nine years, we got you know five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars worth of equity is built up in that house. So you really don't need a lot of those uh, to fast track your financial independence goals. You just had to take a long term view, and uh, the way I see it is that you let time, time, let time do the heavy lifting, not you. Let time do the heavy lifting. That's what this strategy is all about is that it lets you leverage in the power of time and if you can get a good tenant who takes care of the property you know pays a rent pleasant to deal with and they are looking to stay a long time that my friend is the gist of this thing it really can work it really does work once you put it all together and that's really what the big city first strategy is all about so yeah i uh, applaud you karim and uh if i can help you on your journey please let me know and see what we can do uh, but it does work. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, it does work. I tell you, uh, especially when you put in there section eight and you got that guaranteed income stream. Um, you know, it, it really is, uh, uh, you know, a, a good strategy to, to, to consider. Okay. Dow two greetings from Phoenix. Hey, Dow two. Nice to meet you again. You always, you're one of the regulars. Uh, but Dundee, uh, who I spent uh, but Dundee, uh, Obadassa. Greetings from Atlanta. Same to you. Uh, hope all is well in Atlanta. Uh, in this seller financing topic, how would you ensure there's no additional liens on the home? Um, what you want to do is obviously you're going to get uh, you're going to go through settlement through a title company, a settlement company. This is not going to be a private deal. You're going to go through a settlement company who's going to make sure they're going to do a lien search. Uh, they're going to go to the public records to see what liens, if there are any out there, uh, are associated with this property. And you're going to give, you're going to get title insurance. Uh, so, you know, it's on the, 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 the attorney, uh, the settlement company to make sure that they uncover any liens on this property. And uh, because you're going to be getting title insurance, uh, you know, to protect yourself. Uh, so what I'm saying is that you want to make sure that you leverage the uh, the settlement company, the title company, to make sure that uh, you, you, what you're buying is clear. It's a clean title. There are no hidden liens out there. And if there are, then, um, you know, you have insurance that will cover you. Okay. Badande. Again, I apologize if I uh, mispronounce your name. Uh, let's have a look. How do I... 
go about becoming a Section 8 landlord. I purchased the property that was an existing lease, which is set to be, I suppose, set to expire, I assume, February 2024. My plan is to rent it out Section 8. What's your advice on that? Okay. Uh, congratulations. There's no such thing as a, a Section 8 landlord. Uh, what it is is that you have a property and you are allowing uh, somebody who has a voucher to rent from you. Okay, so it sounds like in your scenario, uh, Bernadette, you bought a house or property and, uh, you know, there was an existing tenant in place and that tenant had a voucher and uh, which is set to expire, I assume, in February 2024. Well, uh, normally these uh, these Section 8 contracts, they call them HAP contracts, H-A-P. Uh, they are one year initially and then after that they revert to month to month. And so if you don't want these people out here uh, in your house uh, and uh, if your laws, uh, you know, the state laws where your property is allows you to, you can give the tenant a 30 day notice uh, at the end of the lease term. So in your case, it could be February 2024 if you don't want them there. If you want them in place, then obviously, you know, at least in Washington, you don't have to do anything because it automatically reverts to month to month. Uh, after a year, you can request a rent increase, um, you know, and uh, if you are inheriting tenants, then I would suggest that you may want to do some due diligence uh, on the tenants. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, they do have the right papers in place. You want to get a copy of their uh, loan application, not loan cap, rental application. So at least you know something about them, their name, uh, the social security number, uh, the rental history their employment information, all those different things. Uh, so you want to make sure that there's a, uh, an application that uh, the buyer is going to give to you. And uh, so that's the immediate thing I would do. The other thing is that once, if, once you buy the property, if you don't already own it, is to introduce yourself to the, the renters, uh, who you are, uh, you know, what kind of style you have. Hopefully you're a good landlord. And, uh, you know, you want a decent property and you want the tenants to stay a long time. You want to develop a rapport with your tenant. There are human beings, they're not doors. And uh, so treat them as human beings also. And if you can do that and uh, you can do little other things to make sure that they're happy, then they're more likely to stay with you. So, again, uh, I would say congratulations. I would definitely, um, you know, if, if, if the housing authority where you are is reasonable, uh, I'll definitely try and develop some relationships down there, go see them, explain the situation with you. And uh, and hopefully you can have a good, solid uh, relationship with the folks down at your housing authority. Uh, because it, if you can do that, I think you're, you're way, 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 way ahead of most, most other people. Good question. Let's have a look. 746. We've got both little more questions still here. Uh, when implementing creative financing, have you used a third party company to make the payments to the mortgage company? No, well, I, I haven't. I just pay the mortgage company myself. So uh, typically what I would do, I'll take, let's say the subject two that the subject twos that I've done, I take over the mortgage. So the mortgage is still remains in the seller's name. Uh, every, you know, I rent the property. So every month I get rent from the tenants and uh, every month I send the money, the payments to the mortgage company and uh you know they don't really care where the money comes from uh, you know that i found anyway uh and uh as long as the money's made and so i would uh that's how i did my subject to we have an agreement between the seller and i they were just tired of this house they wanted out and so i was able to take it over and um you know uh i think a couple of years ago so I, I did this. I, I've done these. One of the houses, anyway. I think I bought that one in 2003. So it's a good, you know, 10 years or so. Oh, no, it's two, yeah, 2003. So it's 20 years ago. My goodness. Uh, so I, I yeah, I, I mean, Subject Two has been around for a long time. So uh, I've had this property for so long, and uh, I think the mortgage has paid off. So it's now free and clear. And. Uh, and so I don't have to worry about subject two anymore because uh, the loan's been paid off. But title was transferred to my name. And so I was the legal owner of the property. 
uh, from when the uh, the transaction took place. Uh, but but Bundu again, uh, how do I go about becoming a Section Eight landlord? I purchased property. Uh, I think I've I think I've I've, I've uh, addressed that question. Uh, but for the day, Dow two in seller financing, if the buyer for whatever reason stops paying, how would you get the buyer off the title? Would you have to foreclose? Yes. Now this is where it gets a little interesting. Uh, depending on the state laws, you may because they're not really technically they they owner they have their own title. So if you want to remove them off title, then you have to foreclose on them. Uh, if you are renting, then you may be able to evict them because they don't have a legal title. Um, you know. But they do have an agreement, so it's kind of a gray area. Uh, but typically, you'll have to foreclose uh, if they're on title. So if they have a title ownership interest, then uh, I don't think you can evict. You're going to have to foreclose first. And then after you foreclose, i.e. you wipe out their interest, uh, then you can then, uh, you know, evict them and so on. So, yeah, so if the, so again, if you, if you are taking, so in scenario that Dow2 just said, if I uh, own a property and Dow2 wants to buy it from me and I do some kind of seller financing where he agrees to pay me certain money in exchange for money which I'm borrowing from him, if he doesn't live up to part of the, the you know, his payments, then uh, the question was, do I, what, what's my resource? What's my recourse? And uh, my understanding of the recourse I have is to foreclose on him. To wipe out his interest, and therefore I can get the property back. So I think that's what your question was about. Uh, let's have a look. Karim, uh, I'm from New York City. I'm looking to get properties out of state and rent it out to Section Eight. Can you recommend any areas? And also, how would it work if I would rent it out for Section Eight? Okay, so you're in New York City, and you're looking to. Uh, you know, acquire some properties or at least rent to uh, tenants who have Section 8 vouchers. Can I recommend areas? Uh, Section 8 program is a federal program. So it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 what's the right word? It's implemented uh, across the country. So it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, it's a HUD, pro it's a, uh, a federal program. And it's funded and implemented, uh, at least administered locally, and so on. So, where do you want to buy? It's up to you. Uh, I personally prefer not to buy too far away. Um, you know, so I'm, you know, I live in the DC area, so I tend to buy in the DC area. I don't, I'm not really too familiar with New York City or other jurisdictions ar around the country, uh, but I do know my local market, and uh, and therefore I've taken the time to understand that market, and I've decided this is where I want to invest. So, um, you know, so it depends on you. Uh, there's the, the old saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. There's no La 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 Land, there's no Nirvana. Uh, it's just hard work wherever you go. So pick an area that makes sense for you and take the time to understand that market. Take the time to develop relationships with uh, agents, with um, contractors, with uh, attorneys, with CPAs, with, you know, just take the time to develop relationships with a housing authority, for example, and uh, they can give you some inside uh, information about how it works, where the greatest demand is, if it's one, two, three, four, five bedroom houses, and uh, they'll be able to tell you which tenants have the hardest time finding properties. And uh, there may be a, a landlord, uh, you know, a, so uh, liaison at the housing authority. So you may want to check that out and speak to some people there to get uh, a better understanding of their experiences. So there are lots of different ways to get started, uh, Karim. And uh, hopefully I'll just give you some guide. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I think I may do a, an event soon where we can delve into this a bit more detail. Uh, this is a good topic. Thank you. Uh, Marlon, good evening, Dr. Joe. Hope you're doing well. Hey, Marlon, hope you're doing well as well. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you had a good week, and uh, hopefully you're looking at your next property. Uh, this is a good time to buy, sir, and uh, it's not easy. It's competitive, but it never is easy, and it's always competitive. Okay, Karim, Big City Burr, how can I reach out for your help? 
for you to help. How to find the best areas, what infrastructure I'll need, what finance options are there are there for that. Key points to keep in mind when looking for for property. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the, I, I may do another, uh, uh, what's it called, program, JV program. If that's the case, then uh, you're more than welcome to, if you're interested, to be a part of that one. I'm doing a JV uh, Wealth Builders program with Femi. And he's doing very, very well. He purchased, purchased his house a couple of weeks ago. We're doing the rehab. But I'm more involved in this one. Um, we just started the, the, the project last week. And they've completed the demo. And uh, they've done some work there. We're in the process of getting the, uh, the architect in place so he can do his drawings. So, I mean, we're moving. And uh, I'm going to be involved with this process from start to finish all the way through to... Uh, when the new tenants move in so uh that's ways we can we can work um, if there are ways that we can work together karim i'd be more than happy to do so just shoot me an email uh and then we can talk about it uh can you share more light on the inspections there are lots of different inspections uh you know especially on section eight you've got inspections uh when the tenant first moves in or at least before the tenant moves in and uh the inspections department from the housing authority they come over and they do what they call a housing quality standards hqs inspection they want to check the electrical check the plumbing check the heat check the doors check the windows da, 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 check all that stuff and uh and then there's an annual inspection or biannual inspection depending on where you are where they come back every year or two to make sure that the the property is in compliance with uh, uh hud guidelines uh okay let's have a look pmca thank you for taking time out to your day to give us great advice and great information you're welcome uh pma tce and uh i'm tired for some reason i think i had a late night yesterday and so i'm gonna wrap it up uh on that good note so hopefully today's session was good we talked about seller financing went to a bit more detail on things like subject to lease options rent to own and also seller carrybacks I talked about the pros and cons, the action items that you can take, and uh, the importance of having uh, seller financing as part of your, your toolkit, uh, especially during these changing times. So hopefully uh, you learned quite a few things today, and hopefully uh, you're not going to be intimidated by uh, seller financing, and, uh, and hopefully um, you know, uh, you'll be able to uh, pursue your, your dreams, your goals, your real estate goals, and if I can help you on that journey, please let me know, and I'll do the best that I can. Uh, Karim, one, your one episode changed my viewpoint. Thank you. I'm glad I did. And thank you again. So, my friends, I'm going to wrap it up today, and I'll see you next uh, Wednesday. Uh, life is good. Again, we're going to have this. Uh, if you have some real estate questions and you want to book some time with me, we're going to schedule um, – I'll put the, the final touches on. I'm going, to, I'm going to call it Ask Dr. Joe Now. Ask Dr. Joe Now. That essentially allows you to uh, book some time with me, whether 30 minutes or 60 minutes, where I can answer your specific questions. Uh, we can really deep dive. And uh, especially if you want to implement um, the, 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 the strategies that, um, you know, that I do, the big city burr, Section 8, landlord in, buy and hold, you know, keep intense for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. If you want to learn all that stuff, book some time with me and we can do a deep dive. If you have any questions that you have, anything that's specific to your situation, I'd be more than happy to uh, to delve further and uh, go deep. So my friends, I'm going to call it a day and I will see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Take care. Bye for now.